All right. Can you guys see the new um, screen? We are on the road now. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I tried to get on here and make sure all this was uh, ready to go, but obviously technology is getting the better of me this morning. <laughs> so, all right. Once again, welcome to the session. Um, we're doing the behavior intervention plans, developing those. Um, but as I was saying before, you guys were able to see anything. Um, why don't you take a minute as we're talking about behavior and um, check out these cute little puppies and pick a behavior or a puppy that represents your feelings or thoughts about addressing student behaviors. And go ahead and put that choice in the chat box. Oh. We have number one ready to go. We have a two. <laughs> All right. It is March and you guys are coming up on spring break. So I understand the twos for sure. I see a four for some coffee. <laughs> up another two. Yep. Coffee with you, Shelby. Too. <laughs> oh, you guys are not alone in those feelings at all. But Meredith, she seems to be ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Looking well, good. Looking yeah, good. thank you so much for sharing um, how you guys are feeling. It seems that there are a lot of twos and fours. Um, we got that one in there, but yeah, tired. It's March. Um, you're coming up on spring break. I think a lot of you guys might have it in the next week or so. Um, so things, you know, the time change, I'm sure may have affected as well. So there's a lot going on um, just in general, not even in the year that we're coming back uh, to normal. Um, and then that tired little puppy <laughs> with a four. I know I've got my coffee over here too. So, you know, we're making it through the rest of the school year, but um, hopefully this uh, training will help you like guide some more uh, support in developing those behavior intervention plans um, that will help best support your students and your um, teammates at your schools as well. So, um, and hopefully you feel a little better about all this at the end. Jessica, Danielle responded and said, I have to be honest, the one is because we need ideas to implement. So. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so she's ready to roll. All right, you're excited for the ideas. I like that. <laughs> All right, are we switching? There we go. Um, so going back to that, here are some more, the grab that Padlet code for um, the tools and resources available to you guys um, on our website. And if you don't get those at this time, we can you can reach out and we can definitely get that stuff for you. All right, so today we're going to share our intended outcomes for this training. Um, so one is to learn or review the process of developing a behavior intervention plan. And then the second one is to expand the collection of behavior intervention resources. Um, it sounds like there's needs for both of those, but those resources as well of figuring out how to uh, build the best plan for your kiddo or kiddos, I should say. All right. So when we think about how we are supporting our kids, um, we're really working in the schools to have the same purpose, um, to focus on the prize, which is for the students <laughs> to successfully navigate their educational path by learning and building skills that move them towards completion of school. It's all about teaching and learning and what allows that to happen in our skill building or our school buildings. So, you know, kind of going back to the thing that behavior is taught very much like our academics. So making sure that we're continuing not only to support our kids academically, but behaviorally. And especially now we're getting back to the new normal and our kids need a lot of reteaching of expected behavior or how to be, um, how to build those skills to be successful in their educational environment and complete their education. All right, so developing behavior inter intervention plans is a two-part process. So it's gonna be broken down in two different parts. Um, the first one is developing that well-informed hypothesis for why a student is using the behavior that interferes with their success in a specific setting. So that goes back to, you know, what is the function of this behavior and how do we use that hypothesis to drive that intervention plan to um, help the student be successful. 
And then the second part is reshaping the student's learning scape through, um, we're looking at explicit instruction, environmental changes, implementing the intervention plan. And when we have intervent or implement the intervention plan, we're also making sure that it's done with fidelity, being monitored with fidelity and utilizing instruction and how the student is growing through this whole process. And then we also have to make sure that we're documenting and reporting that progress. So the behavior intervention plan is all these things that are in place that are fueled by the hypothesis of that function of behavior, and then making sure that it's implemented with fidelity, and you're constantly looking at, is this working? Is this student's behavior improving? Are we seeing the growth that we want to see? So sometimes it does mean we have to go back and make a few changes to make sure that the student is still improving. So um, when we think about building these plans, um, a great suggestion is to do the work of developing a, a BIP is best completed by a team. Um, for any student uh, receiving special education services, legal requirements would include that case conference members plus other needed roles are on a team, as well as required documentation of decisions and actions in the individualized education plan, possibly even reevaluation timelines. So, Think about that team. It's a, it's very, it's like your case conference team. It's a multidisciplinary group, um, people that have different experiences with that student um, in different settings. So, um, and then making sure that you're bringing that team together and documenting the decisions and actions in the IEP. And then also looking that if you have to do a reevaluation, making sure that you're meeting um, that timeline and even meeting within that timeline. So going back to that, let's think about who is on your team. Um, even then, like all your team members may not be engaged in the classroom. So the school psych may do your hypothesis for the function of the behavior. Um, how do you build? I want you to think about how do you build an actual team-based process? We start with established meetings, grade level and student assistant teams, um, academic teams, MTSS data reviews, an agenda item regarding growth and behavioral skills, what students are meeting the behavioral expectations, what students are struggling. Um, sometimes when we're the people that build our behavior intervention plans or possibly even doing the FBA on our own, um, we're kind of building that all together, but realizing that there are people that can help support this process to help build a more well-rounded behavior intervention plan, that's such a valued piece of part of this process. So think about some of those structures that you might already have in place and what kind of um, people are on those teams. So when we look at what you might have on the team for the student um, that already is receiving special education services, the teacher of record, um, a teacher of service, an administrator, the student when appropriate. Um, I know we pull in our high school students oftentimes with their IEP meetings, uh, even middle school, but think about your kiddos. If they are, you know, you can always do an interest inventory of a, a younger student, but you could do that with an older student too. That brings them in as part of the team. You're looking at family and parent members. What about that school counselor or the social worker, a behavior specialist, if you um, are fortunate to have access to one, and a school psychologist. So those are all members of a team that can help um, successfully be a part of this process. We're also looking at community members. So that football coach or choir director, someone that interacts with that student, not necessarily in the educational environment, but um, in an outside way. Instructional assistants or paraprofessionals, the bus driver, the bus driver greets them at the beginning of the day and the end of the day. So that might be someone who has um, some input that could be helpful, um, a part of your process cafeteria staff, um, someone with a positive rapport with the student. 
that may be the most unlikely person in your school. It could be the custodian who, you know, lets them carry the paper towels to the bathroom and they have a good conversation every day. So really thinking outside of the box if this is the typical case conference um, committee members, but looking at who else has a hand in this child's day-to-day -day life um, and who could give really good insight on um, how they're functioning across different settings. All right, so when we start the process for behavior intervention plans, we have to think about how do we know the student's behavior is a behavior of concern? Um, so when we go into that behavior of concerns part of the IEP, we look at that very first part where we're like, okay, let's think about this. There is a behavior of concern for the case or case conference committee to discuss. So you answer yes or no. So we're going to go in. If we're developing behavior intervention plan, we're going to say yes. Okay, so when we're looking at these. Um, is it really a behavior of concern? So um, cries when asked to work independently, avoids uh, peers during breaks or free, free time. Uh, teachers see evidence of cutting behavior, curses at the instructor, uses profanity in conversations, doesn't eat lunch four days a week. So think about these. Which ones are a behavior of concern? Like, or are they all behavior of concern? So no, they aren't. Yes, or maybe they are. But thinking about what makes behavior a behavior of concern. So is it context? intensity, repetition, volume, setting, or age of the student. Sometimes if you think about the behavior of concern that a first grader does, may be more of a concern if it's an older student. Like if a younger student is, it could be just age appropriate, relatively age appropriate, but if a high school student is doing it, then that's not, that's not age appropriate. It's a behavior of concern. And looking at intensity, you know, is it just like if you if they're crying when asked to do independent work, is it all the time? Does it get really loud? Is it interrupting their learning or learning of others? So really looking at those behaviors that you're observing and deciding, is it a behavior of concern? So when we um, hear some considerations, so kind of going back into that for behavior of concern, but before this, have we done the preventative work of teaching the expectations? Okay, so have we told and not taught the skills we want students to use instead of behavior? Have we reinforced the use of the skill enough? Has there been enough opportunity to practice it? Generalize it. If so, and the behavior is still out of concern, can we provide a description of the behavior and also how the students, oh, I apologize, my mouse got a little crazy. Um, oh, sorry, guys. Also, how the student's behavior aligns or doesn't align with our learning community expectations. So we need to make sure that you have done some of the preventative work of teaching those expectations. So, if you're thinking that I'm seeing this behavior, have you gone in to kind of do some intervention pieces? Are you providing the opportunity to teach the skill and then them to practice it in the setting, oh, well, in isolation and then in the setting and seeing some growth there, making sure that there's been a lot of opportunity to practice. Maybe you're teaching the skill in isolation, but there's not a lot of opportunity for them to practice it in that setting. So making sure that we're creating those opportunities and intentionally teaching those skills or to our students. A lot of times we can tell them things, but if our kids may need modeling and more support in learning those skills. So when we look at this, what rises to the level of bringing the behavior um, to the team? We really have to look at these questions when we're making those considerations. So going back to that, it removes the student from instruction. Um, 
Like they aren't having access to their classroom. They're not able, they're not having access to the school building. Um, thinking about, is it harmful or dangerous to their self or others? You know, is their behavior hurting them? Is it hurting their peers or adults? Um, once again, going back to that, you know, it isolates the student from others. Not necessarily the same as being removed from instruction, but there's something that isolates them or keeps them out of uh, being able to engage um, with other peers or adults. Um, it regularly interrupts instruction flow. So it's constant and cons consistent behavior that interrupts the teacher's ability to teach um, and provide instruction to that student or all, and or all students. And going along off with that, it pulls self or others off task. So that interruption can also be just distracting others or themselves and keeping them from um, engaging in instruction or keeping others from engaging in instruction. So when we think about identifying behaviors of concern, we're gonna go a little further. When we think about behaviors, we're in sync across the building or grade level or the department. So have a discussion with your school staff, grade level team or department and say hit, you like your partner may say they hit, another person like myself may say the student punches. What about teasing versus taunting? Just what is a disrespectful comment? I know many of you have probably been in meetings with your peers or administrators or other people, and you say this is a disrespectful comment, but what is your definition of that behavior? Is it the same behavior as your peer is seeing? So just kind of making sure that we understand what, you know, teasing versus taunting or hitting versus punching. When I think of hit, I see something different than a punch. So making sure that you guys have those same definitions and understanding of what the behavior is. Um, so asking yourself, what is that disrespectful comment? What does it look like and sound like when you see it happen? Okay, so really going in when you are talking with your people on the team or in different settings about this student and they say they hit or punch, but asking those um, questions that dive a little deeper. What's it look like? What's it sound like? When does it happen? Think about what happens before it so that you're able to kind of pull together a consensus of what that behavior is. Like, and is it the same behavior? So going back to that, are you all talking about the same behavior? Um, are you labeling them the same way and identifying those critical behaviors worthy, worthy of a discipline referral? Because we all know that some, Sometimes we have teach some teachers that are able to just manage um, a critical behavior and they won't send on a discipline referral. And then we have other teachers, which is okay, have a different tolerance level of the behavior. So that can look very different with that data that that's automatic existing data, which we'll get into later, um, that is being created, but it may not look the same across all the settings because you have different people with different levels of tolerance of behavior. So um, a little take home task for you guys, if you would like to do it, um, there's a behavior definition handout uh, on the Padlet. It's handout number two from the National Center of Intensive Intervention. Um, it is just kind of like being able to uh, practice that. So doing that activity with um, some of your peers when you're problem solving a student might be helpful. So um, going and using that just to kind of guide that practice of being able to understand, you know, all those different pieces about behavior. All right, I have talked a lot for the past uh, 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Um, so go ahead and let me know in the chat, like some comments or questions you might have about the information that I've shared so far. Yes, this is your opportunity. If you have a comment about what you've heard or if you have a question or need some clarification from Jessica, um, please enter that in the chat and we'll share that out with the group. 
Someone's asking, can we get a copy of the slides at the end? Yes. It's posted on the Padlet. Should be there right now. Thanks, Beth. Not seeing any other questions right this moment or comments, but Beth does say thank you. And it's awesome that she can have the slides. <laughs> All right. Well, um, if something comes up as we go, just put it in the chat and Elisa will either help. We can figure out if it's time to answer it now or table it and come back to it. Um, but just go ahead. And if you have questions about stuff, put them in there and we can figure it out together. All right. So the next thing we're going to do is we are going to jump into a quick case study. Um, this is Jeff, and Jeff is a, an amazing little kid, but we're going to kind of read through uh, this case study about Jeff um, and some of the things going on with them. So um, you can read through on your own, but I can do a quick reading as well. Um, he's been having difficulty paying attention in class. He's been inattentive and disruptive. They, the behaviors are leaving his seat during work time, crumpling paper and expressing anger towards peers and teachers. So we're most concerned about Jeff's cursing and threatening comments towards peers. These behaviors occur almost every day, sometimes in multiple classes. Most of these behaviors usually only last a little while, but sometimes he will remain off task for several minutes. Jeff's classmates typically ignore the behavior, though sometimes a few of the boys do whisper, giggle, and make fun of him for outbursts. Mostly his behavior is ignored and considered part of everyday routine. These behaviors have significantly impacted Jeff's ability to work and are also affecting his ability to get along with peers. I know we've probably had, all of us had a few Jeffs in our lives, and we might have one right now. So I know just thinking about those behaviors you heard in this paragraph, let's move um, and use that to kind of help guide our behavior intervention plan building. And so um, let's think about this. Does he have a behavior of concern that rises to the level of a behavior intervention plan? So critical definitions and critical questions that we have to think about. So before we get to those critical questions, we need to know several important definitions. The pattern of behavior, what is that? So it says that it's a repeated occurrences of behavior in one or more settings and behavior occurs with a predictable series of triggers, right? So one behavior that happens in music class but never happens again, there's no pattern of behavior for that, right? It's not a repeated occurrence. But maybe there's always a specific time of day that you see a behavior or week or month or year um, environment or expectations, you know, the general education environment where they get the majority of their instruction. There may be a behavior that happens there, but doesn't happen in the other environments. Is it when someone is there and or when they're absent? Maybe it's like, it could be a substitute teacher that when they're in that classroom, there may be a behavior. Or if it's um, a change in who's in the classroom. Um, and then other things like types of activities. We all have those kiddos, I'm sure, that noise level just kind of creates a really hard environment for your kiddos to um, function in or you know keep their behavior in check. So thinking about that noise level or the different structure of classrooms, we know that our kids, you know, the structure of lunch is so different from your general education classroom or the classroom they spend the, most of their day in. So thinking about how that structure changes and if there's behaviors coming out there and that, you know, the level of independence that's required in different spaces. There's a lot of independence that's required in across all settings, but think of the level of independence that and um, understanding or expectations of the bathroom or um, transitions in the classroom of getting out the right notebook or those types of things. So bring all those things into mind when we're thinking of that pattern of behavior. So also this definition impedes it prevents a student from starting or maintaining or, or finishing a task. It draws the student off task or in, in the, interrupts the instructional flow. So it's 
really interfering with the ability to participate or focus on learning activities, but also that's stuff for others, right? We have to make sure that our other students are able to, you know, participate and focus on their learning activities. So let's think about that. Um, if the answer is no, we have documented a concern on the record, right? So if we're saying no, it's not a be, it's not, um, there's not a pattern of student behavior, then we need to document that. If we're not sure, we're going to consider a behavioral support. All right. So um, what is a team to do? Uh, there's a lot. So that this is where your team really comes in place to sit down and think about how can we meet the need of the student because we're, we're not really sure. So one thing to start with might be changes or adjustments to the environment. So here are some examples. All the teachers will use the same nonverbal prompt to address the behavior of concern. Um, we can move Michael's locker from the second floor to the first floor, creating a different travel pattern for his afternoons. Um, an accommodation could be same expected outcomes, a different path for the journey. So thinking about providing hands-free options as part of daily life um, or for, you know, teaching explicitly a coach what you want me to do. Sometimes that means teaching social skills, like a student doesn't have to be or have to have an IEP to be taught social skills, right? So just thinking about how what can you do to kind of intervene in that piece because you're not sure that it's a pattern, but you want to come together to meet the need of the student. Um, oh, there's our stuff. So we're thinking about that, the accommodations, the adjustments, we're looking at hands-free stuff or coaching them, telling them what to do. All right, this is where we would document our plan of supports in IIEP, right? So all through that behavior page, this is where we come through and we start to look at how we can support the students in um, the environment. So uh, you would typically select one or a few um, to be implemented while you're collecting the data um, throughout this process. All right. So let's think about this. Does the pattern of student behavior impede his or her learning um, of that or others? So when we think about this, the case conference uh, committee determines if the pattern of behavior impedes their learning. Um, if the answer is yes, we're required to take action, okay? So that means that we need to document that. Um, IDEA says that the IEP team shall, in the case of the child whose behavior impedes his or her learning um, or that of others, consider when appropriate strategies, including positive behavioral interventions, strategies and supports to address that behavior. This could still be a behavioral intervention if we already have a greater understanding of the student, um, just documented and not just guessing. So we have to make sure that when we say yes, that we are documenting how we are going to, or documenting the behavior, and then documenting how we're going to support that student, or we already are supporting that student. All right, so developing a behavior intervention plan is a two-part process. We talked about this earlier, so we're gonna start on that very first part, which is, the well-informed hypothesis for why the student is using the behavior that interferes with success in a specific setting. So we have to understand what is the function of that behavior and understand if they're doing this, then they're what they're trying to get out of it. And then we'll move on to two, which is reshaping the student's learning skit and how you're going to build that bit of behavior intervention plan to support them through that process. Oh. All right, so interaction between the behavior and the environment. We're looking at that piece I talked about previously was conducting the functional behavior assessments to develop that individualized behavior support plan. I wanna kind of go back to that word individualized. Uh, oftentimes we may have certain things in place for a student that maybe is more of a tier two support, 
um, I'm thinking things like check in, check out that we have in place for that student. But if we're to the point where we need an, a behavior intervention plan for the student, it's individualized because that general support that might go out to like a tier two, like check in, check out, or which could be part of helping support that child. We have to make sure that we're adding more supports that are specific to this child and this specific to their functional behavior um, assessment that, that has the hypothesis connected to it. So we're going to look at the interaction between the student's behavior and the learning environment. Um, and going back to like high leverage practice number 10, uh, using special education, uh, oh, sorry, excuse me. You can go to the Council of Exceptional Children, um, which is a special education professional organization. That, and it has a ton of the high leverage practices in there um, and responsibilities. Uh, so there's some great resources in there from McCleskey, I have a hard time saying that for oftentimes, but making sure that um, it's a, you're looking at the individualized behavior supports. So um, here we go, the functional behavior assessment. Um, I know you guys have all heard those FBAs and BIPs, but this is the first part of it. It's that systematic process for identifying a student's problem or interfering behaviors, right? So in order to build um, an individualized behavior intervention plan that really meets the need of that child, we have to understand, we have to use this systematic process to identify those problem behaviors. So we're looking at those events or conditions uh, predicting the occurrence of behaviors. So sometimes you might use a ABC chart, like an antecedent behavior consequence, um, just collecting data on when you're seeing these things, maybe um, how often things happen. And maybe it's across different settings, like what setting is it happening in at time of day, going back to when we're talking about those conditions um, or events that maintain the behavior. So really taking a holistic look at the environment the student's in across different settings and understanding um, what the interfering behavior is and then when it's happening and what the function of it is. So we're gonna gather data. Data is so important to this process. Uh, data helps drive the, um, helps set kind of a baseline for your kiddo and it helps drive the instruction and the amount of support that you're su using to support your kiddo. So it's really important to gather data. Um, and there's some great things about it. Like you may have existing data, so you don't, you just need to put all that together, but you also might need to grab, like get some more data or more data in this part. So, but first we're gonna talk about um, indirect data. It's done by student or people who know the student best and direct observations. So indirect data is collecting information from people's perceptions. So that might be a teacher interview across different settings in the uh, school environment. It could be uh, going back to those like community member interviews or community members that could be on the team, grabbing um, some information from them as well. Uh, and just understanding the perceptions of behavior. So, you know, interviews, checklists, questionnaires, rating scales. Um, and then you're looking at the direct uh, assessment data. So observing the student in the context which problem behavior reportedly occurs. So if you're seeing, if the reports back from people are that we're seeing this behavior during math every single day or on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Fridays, then you want to go in and do that direct assessment data during that time. If you're never seeing the behavior in PE, um, going in to look for that behavior that's been identified, you're probably not going to get the data that's needed to understand um, and drive the necessary supports for that student. Um, and also another thing is informal note taking, highly structured observation forms and trained specialists and observers. So if you're sending someone in to do an observation to grab that assessment data, you want to make sure that you guys are on the same page of what data you're looking for. Um, sometimes we 
are overwhelmed or overloaded and we're like, can you go grab, do this quick observation for me? It is so important for the person that's doing that observation understands how to take the data and what the purpose of it is and the whole process. Uh, because if they're going in for you or for someone else and they're not gathering the data as expected to help grab that, that information needed, then you're not gonna have the same data across all uh, observed areas. So gathering data, we're continuing on that. So. Um, we're looking through a lens of where the behavior does and does not happen, which I kind of talked about before. So thinking about that, what contributes to the behavior um, uh, like occurrence or what doesn't contribute to it? Are they missing a step in executing the skills we want them to use? And how has this impacted the student's growth um, progress you know, academically or you know, socially in the classroom? So it includes those systematic observations. So we've got to look at all those different pieces, um, like I talked about before. And then one thing that I always think about is like, are there skill or performance deficits? Like, do we need to teach this skill to this student or do they have the skill, but they're really struggling on using it in the environment that we're seeing the behavior? So a kiddo may say, I know, or they have the skill of, of um, you know, raising their hand or whatever you've been teaching them in that social group but they're still struggling to perform that skill in the environment that you're seeing the behavior. So it's really important to think about that. Do I need to teach something or do I need to support that skill in the environment of using it there? All right, so going back to our friend Jeff, um, we're gonna, what data do we already have about Jeff? This, this data is the, in my opinion, the easier stuff to gather, right? It's stuff that you don't have to go out necessarily and seek in observations. It's stuff that's just being gathered for you and it can be so informational. Um, so thinking about connecting the academic piece to the behaviors, um, we're putting both those things together. It's not separate, we're gonna bring them together. Um, how is this behavior interfering with their opportunity to learn skills? Um, to developing relationships, which we impact uh, how our kids learn skills. So let's book, look back at Jeff. Do we all have the information we need to better plan for any needed instruction um, or supports? But when we're going back here, let's look at data we've already got, right? We have attendance records. We have benchmark assessments for academics, looking at those behaviors, screeners, or reports, work samples, discipline referrals. I mean, we can, some of you guys may use um, class dojo in elementary to do uh, communication or whatever other types of communication that might move up through middle school or high school, like that secondary piece, like that's data that's already there. Um, you have your progress reports on IEP goals, that's data, um, and your progress monitoring stuff. So there's stuff that's already been collected for you. You just got to look through it. So then we have to think about that next direct um, stuff. So what else do we need on top of that existing data that we already have? So we, you already have informative data, but here are some data tools that you could potentially be, that could potentially be research sources for you for gathering more data. So um, I'll give you a brief description of these tools. And then um, we have them on the Padlet for you guys to go back to. Uh, but just this is kind of like a teaser of the types of resources that we have on the Padlet. So there's a root cause chart, which is very helpful in um, helping you figure out the import guide in impulsiveness or poor self-monitoring. Um, the direct behavior rating scale from the University of Connecticut um, is wonderful in trying to determine the response to interventions and in, in what you've got in place for that student. The student functional assessment interview, reinforcement survey, those are so helpful in just kind of understanding like what is going to reinforce that kiddo. Um, 
And those can differ. You can have ones that are more ele elementary based or, you know, intermediate or secondary based, but it, those are that kiddo having that can guide a lot of ways that you can reinforce the expected behaviors that you want to see. Um, Terrence Scott has an excellent uh, group interview document. There's also the data collection decision tree from Hands and Autism. They have um, an excellent guide just kind of how to collect data that might be helpful. And then also data collection methods to just guide you in what ways that you can gather more data. So that Padlet has tons of resources on it, but here are a few that are available to you just kind of to give you a little look inside before uh, you dive, you can dive deep into that Padlet. All right, guys, I've talked again for another 20 minutes. So uh, is there any, are there any questions in the chat or comments or anything that I can answer at this point? This is again an opportunity for for you to uh, to sh share your questions or comments. Um, I did add into the um, the chat the link to the Padlet again. If you want to take a look at um, a couple of those tools, um, there's more information there. Not seeing any comments or questions at this time, Jessica. All right. Well, like I said, you can jump into the chat as needed. Um, happy to answer questions as we go. All right, our next thing is, did it go to the right slide? Oh, yes, okay. So during the reevaluation, re like the in the meantime supports and documentation. So you're doing a functional behavior assessment and you're that's a reevaluation for the student. So you're gonna look at what you're going to do within that timeline. So thinking about what, data you're going to collect or what supports you're going to put in place for that student. And that is all stuff that you can use to build your behavior intervention plan later. So you're going to identify and document the supports the student and staff uh, that is being done during that time. Um, and then include a plan, plan for progress monitoring, um, effective of the supports, and this could all be helpful data to help drive your behavior intervention plan um, and just see what kind of growth or tweaks or changes need to happen um, as a reevaluation and then guiding your functional behavior assessment. Jessica, yes. there is a, a question that, that is, is pretty timely here. Ashley's asking, oh. um, do you have any suggestions for when you, you're not getting that feedback back from teachers, if, if teachers aren't filling out the, the ABC charts or, you know, for data collection, you know, any suggestions for how to, how to encourage yeah. your colleagues? <laughs> yeah, so I think one thing, one thing first is to kind of, to bring them on that team. I know that time is one of the most precious um, things that we have, and it's hard to come by at the mo uh, oftentimes, but, and, but to allow time for them to help me as a team um, and that problem solving team for your students, that they're um, engaged in the process and understanding that they have a, a needed role in that piece. But on the other end, recognizing that ABC data or on off test data or things like that are hard for general education teachers to do while teaching. So going back to that team piece, like looking at who's on your team and who can help take that data for them. Um, so do you have your school counselor that can go in during that math class and take that data for you? Um, or do you have a time during your day that you can go in and take that data. Maybe it's the assistant principal or the administrator that's sitting on that problem solving team that can go in and help take that data. We all have, our days are very full and we all have a lot of our, on our plates, but being able to take ABC data within like a 20 minute period can be really hard, but some if you don't have that team piece where you can say like the AP can go in or a counselor, you can also set it up for the teacher, write it on a post-it and then fill it in later. So some strategies of, if it's not like 
the behavior is not happening every like two minutes and it's something that happens like once a class period, that should be something that can be documented. But just stressing that need of, I have to have this information. Here are some ways that I can support you. And if it's still not getting done, then uh, reaching out for, for support above you on trying to get that um, data collected. But I think the best way coming from my own experience is your gen ed counterparts, or maybe some of you guys are gen ed teachers that are in this, are stressed. And if there is a behavior of concern going on in their classroom, it's really hard for them to um, take on that additional responsibility at this point. So empathizing with them and trying to figure out how you can get that data um, while supporting them in the process. But ask for help. I mean, you guys have a lot on your plates. Reach out to the other support staff in your building. Um, there are other people that can help take that load off of your plate, but it is very important, like we talked about earlier, to make sure that you have trained them in taking that data. So it may take a little bit of time because that's a skill they have to learn and we have to teach it of them coming in and you modeling that, them watching you um, maybe a few times before they can go do it on their own. So it's building a capacity of your team as well. I know I just talked a lot on that. Was that helpful or does any, um, is there another suggestion, Elisa, you might have another suggestion or? Um, she, uh, Jessica, she went on to, sh to share that, um, you know, when, when she goes in to visit the classroom and the teachers say, oh, he's, you know, he did fine. When clearly when she walks in, she sees the, you know, the behavior concern they're addressing. Um, and so, so it's not fine, perhaps. Yeah. Um, but what, one thing that you know, we can do on our part is be, you know, if he's fine, what was he doing when he was fine? What did it look like? What did it sound like? You know, what, you know, so that again, trying to get a description, because maybe he was fine for those few minutes. He was on task, he was, he was sitting in a seat, he kept his hands to himself, she was listening, whatever it was, you know, get that description of the behavior so that again, you know, that description should be so clear that I could act it out. And you could say, yep, that's what he was doing. So- Right, you know. right. I mean, it's, some of it might be going up to that tolerance piece of like what some teachers are like, it's fine, everything is okay. And other teachers are like, this is a behavior of concern going on in my classroom. So when you're trying to observe it in that classroom where it's fine, everything is okay, it may still be happening. At least that was such a good thing to bring up about, you know, give me a description of what was going on during that time. And, and when I make the request, you know, I want you to observe for this, is he um, poking people with his pencil? I mean, you know, specifically, did you yeah. see that happen? Did you get a report of that happening? Poking someone with his pencil, you know, and let's hope that's, that's not what's going on. But, you know, <laughs> yeah. but that makes it clear enough, you know, I should be able to act it out. You know, is this what it looked like? Is this what it sounded like? Yep, that's what he did. Nope, he was he was a little bit higher pitched. No, he was howling. No, it, you know, whatever it was, right. you know, th those descriptions. And, and, and it's just part of the information if you want your colleagues to understand. We're, tr we're trying to, to, to teach and learn here. So we've got to know what the baseline skills are mm -hmm. like any other, any other skill. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. Getting that full description and understanding. It's hard when you've got, a kiddo that's um, struggling behaviorally in your class and trying to understand, like get past the, and that roadblock of that students, it's, I'm struggling with them, but this plan that we, if we work together and we all gather this data and we build a, a supportive plan that's implemented with fidelity, it's going to make things better. But sometimes it's a little hard to see past that. But yeah, Lisa's right, going back and getting, understanding that, what the description of the behavior is and if it was happening or not. Hopefully that was helpful. <laughs> All right, I will move on, but go ahead guys and put things in the chat as we go. I'm happily to, happy to work through that with you all. All right, so reevaluation data. So we're gonna do an analysis of just data and forming that hypothesis. So this is a process that's really unique to the student. Um, you can review the high points of Jeff's data and form um, a hypothesis of the function of behavior. So um, what do we know now 
or what now do we know from the data that was collected regarding his behavior of concern? Okay, does this information confirm our original thinking or do we have different information to consider, right? So you may be getting all this information that you asked across different settings or, and then the uh, data that you collected is kind of telling you different information. So you're gonna need to take all of that in consideration to figure out what the hypothesis of this, the function of Jeff's behavior um, of concern is. So think about that. What is our hypothesis of, this, of the function of his behavior? Um, and also thinking about, can we have multiple hypotheses and where do we begin with that? Um, so if you're thinking about Jeff's behavior, kind of think about that. Like, what do you think, why do you think that he is um, under what conditions Jeff is likely to do Y for Z reasons? Sorry, that wasn't super clear, but um, thinking about that hypothesis piece. All right, so let's look at those important considerations from his data, right? Going back to that, those few paragraphs I read you um, a little while ago. So if we pull all that information, we're gonna pull out um, important considerations. So becoming visibly agitated, mumbles, uh, negative verbaliz verbalizations. So thinking about that is that a lot that could be, he's only doing verbal threats, right? Um, takes 30 minutes to return to work after an incident. So let's look at that again. Most of the time his peers also ignore Jeff's mumbling. Um, the type of work task that makes a difference. So reading an unfamiliar text. Uh, Jeff, 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 Jeff stated, I don't hear as good when I feel like I'm exploding. And then behaviors are seen more often in the morning and once started, um, seem to continue. And then what other questions we might have about Jeff? So those are considerations that we pulled from the uh, information that kind of guide what we understand about Jeff and his behavior. All right, so a potential hypothesis for Jeff's behavior. When Jeff is given an assignment or task involving the reading of an unfamiliar text, he becomes verbally aggressive, threatening physical harm towards peers to avoid the task. So we've talked about what the conditions are, uh, what the behavior is, um, and why it happens. So. We're gonna to get to that second part of the two plan process. I do see there's a notification in the chat. Elisa, is there anything that I need to address before we move on or we're good? I just made the note that there's a sample of Jeff's FBA analysis in, Perfect. in the Padlet. Yes, thank you so much for that. All right, so we're on to that second plan process, second part process, because we've already done the well-informed hypothesis about Jeff. And this is reshaping the learning scape through planning, okay? So it, we're gonna come back uh, to the full group and think about what's life-changing for him. So planning is important, being intentional, intentional, implementing the plan, monitoring the plan, and then documenting and reporting progress. So going back to what is going to make a change for him, but looking at those learning function-based replacement behaviors. So we need to make, think about what we're gonna to do to teach him or get use, use those replacement behaviors. So there's three things, provide specially designed instruction, provide accommodations and provide environmental supports for Jeff. So let's look at STI. Uh, as special education teachers, I'm sure you know a lot about SDI, um, but it's very important to uh, supporting a student academically, but even, you know, going back to that behaviorally. So it is adapting that con those content methods and or instructional delivery to address those unique needs of a student. Uh, a few slides ago, I talked about the individualized uh, behavior intervention plan. We have individualized uh, education plans for students. So our delivery of instruction needs to be 
individualized. It needs to be focused on the student. It can't be that general thing that is provided for so many other students because we're looking at this student specifically. Um, so what does that student need um, that special education can provide so that they're able to be successful? And that is in um, this handout is Padlet handout number four uh, when you guys check that out. So um, when we're talking about the different ways that uh, we can accommodate or support a student in the classroom, we talked about that hands-free soap dispenser that came up for hand washing. Think, it, think about that, like return back to Jeff. For environment and accommodations, we do we provide a potential a list of potential supports and have the group choose a couple that match for that, Jeff, okay? So let's look about accommodations and then think about those. Um, accommodations, there are changes uh, to the curriculum or assessments that provide access to this general education curriculum, but they don't fundamentally alter that uh, learning goal or grade level standard. Those are modifications, right? So if you're changing um, the grade level target or the standards, then that's a modification, but accommodations make it more accessible uh, for the students. So we're thinking about size, time, input, output, level of support, you know, if we're, can we change the way or um, a student is able to, uh, you know, accept instruction or how they can show that what they know. Think about, I'm sure you guys use time a lot, like more time on assessments or more time for task completion, um, or maybe they just need a less amount of time. Um, size, thinking about that, reducing the number of items, but it's not changed with, you know, or difficulty doesn't change. If the student can show what they know within four answers, do they need to do all 10? Um, so just kind of thinking about that type of accommodation for a student. So then we move into environmental supports. Um, so environmental support, so looking at what can be in place in the environment that they're learning in. So across all settings, so looking at time, space, material, and interactions that will support the positive behaviors that you want to see, right? So you can look at all those, pe all those pieces that were similar to accommodations of, you know, pacing of activities, predictable routines, creating visual spatial organization, um, pictures and objects and words or schedules, um, the way that you structure activities, organizing things, increasing um, an understanding of elapsed time. These are all environmental supports for that student. So when we think about a student that needs more support, we can look at increased productivity and compliance with routines can be achieved in challenging. Uh, let me reword that, I apologize. So when we create an environment that is more accessible for our students that look at how, um, what supports can really support them using that positive behavior or that replacement behavior in the classroom can, um, increase the expected behavior that we want to see, right? So if we change things in the environment, but we're still, but we're not, that are more supportive to what they need, then you're more likely to see the replacement behaviors that you um, expect. Paula Kluth does a lot of, um, or has a lot of information about this work in the, her work as well. So she's a good resource for um, how we can change an environment for a student. Um, so just kind of thinking about that piece of environmental supports. Sometimes they look like accommodations and they can kind of cross over in some of those things too, but. Jessica, could yes. I give an example? One of my Please favorites on, on that yes. list, increasing an understanding of elapsed time. When when working with a student that needed to, to learn more wait time or to be patient yeah. or you know you do this first and then you do this next 
that not having an understanding of how much time has passed was really critical. Yeah. And so, you know, we use visuals and bubble timers and, th- you know, this is about how long you're going to need to work on this, or this is how long you need to wait. When you see the, you know, the bubbler stops moving, yes. that's about, you know, and, and so it was important, you know, and that allowed us to move forward with using wait time in different ways. Cause then he had an understanding of, okay, this is what it feels like to wait this long. And, you know, yeah that might be an environmental support example that makes sense to <laughs> No, that thank you so much for sharing that you're right because oftentimes a kiddo could be you're like okay if you wait you know if then and they were like okay the immediate they want that immediate or that impulse like trying to work on that impulsivity of like well, you have to wait for this amount of time so thank you so much for bringing that example up that is very helpful All right, so moving on to more environmental or behavioral support. So um, teaching them how to chunk in task, uh, creating those regular movement opportunities, um, accept reservations for student work areas. So thinking about like, do you have like a comfy seat in your classroom um, that everybody always wants to look at, but maybe doing a sign-up sheet so that they know they're going to have access to it, not just whoever gets there first. So uh, creating a structure around things that can be a little unstructured. Um, Flexible seating can feel unstructured, but providing opportunity and that student knows they're able to get to it at some point is going to be very helpful. Fidgets or doodling or sketching, we have to teach our kids how to use those. Um, When we provide those or as an environmental support for that student, they still need to be taught how to use that support in their environment. and teaching them how to use a calming area, right? Uh, we have to you know, set the expectations for that environment for them to go to so that they know how, like what the expectations are and what their behavior in that environment are supposed to look like. So it's not just a go to this space um, and do whatever you feel, you've got to teach them how to utilize it. And then teaching them ways to move around the classroom without distracting others at work. I know even as an adult, and I've been to trainings where there's a, an extended uh, sit time, I typically move towards like the side or the back so that I'm able to stand up and either move a few steps one way or another, or just put my body in a different position so that I'm able to pay attention. So we have to teach students that what's an appropriate way to stand up or move um, around the classroom. Uh, otherwise it could look, you know, running around the back end or something like that. But when we provide these environmental supports that are, um, important for them, we also have to remember, it's not something they've normally been given and they may need some teaching on how to do those things. So we have to remember that a kid may not know how to chunk or chunk work or tasks. So we have to teach those things. Otherwise, they can't use that environmental support um, appropriately. But we also have to remember that all these things that you're teaching, like, look at those. Those aren't the typical sit in your chair or work through everything that I've given you. Um, It's giving them more space, but it also is building those personal responsibility skills and empowering them to take care of what they need, um, respect others' work time, and to make independent choices. So understanding they've got these supports in here, how do I utilize that to support myself and make sure that I'm not interrupting or impacting uh, my peers' learning? All right, so we're going to think about if the if you've got that student, you're like, if they could just do this one thing, um, they would be successful. So use the these prompts to consider skills the student needs to develop. So in addition to academic skills that have been found to impact their contrib- or contribute to their behavior. So, so oftentimes I'm like, if this student could problem solve, they would be, you know, they would move forward or they would be successful. So what is life-changing for them? Teaching those problem-solving strategies. If this student could communicate their feelings appropriately or use the right language for it, then they would be able to, you know, get through the classroom or work through 
how they're feeling. And then they, it wouldn't be an interruption to their learning or learnings of others. I mean, think about conflict resolution. If they were able to resolve conflict um, successfully, then that might keep that oftentimes will keep them in the classroom and they're able to engage in their learning environment. But some of our kids do not have conflict resolution skills. So we have to teach that, but that is a lifelong skill that translates from whenever they're having, you know, preschool, they're having toy, you know, fighting things. And then all the way up to high school, college, and as they're adults. These are all skills that are life-changing for our students. So thinking about Jeff, what, what's life-changing for him? So let's think about like, what replacement skills will he be taught? What environmental supports? What accommodations, if any? So put your ideas in the chat or add them to the Padlet you guys have opportunity to add to that, but why don't you put them in the chat? What types of replacement behaviors would be helpful for Jeff? And maybe some accommodations and or environmental supports that might help him use these replacement behaviors. We'll give you a little time to think of, of a skill that Jeff needs to learn and maybe drop that in the chat. So I, I remember the, um, so one of the behaviors was the verbal aggression and threatening physical harm, um, crumpling up his paper. Um, I remember reading being an area like unfamiliar text that for reading class was going to be an area of um, where you, they would start to see the behaviors. So if we're thinking about what replacement behaviors, maybe one or two, and then how we could support him. We have expressed feelings appropriately. Okay? Yeah. And we need to, to stretch that out. So what is, you know, what are the feelings we're, we're focusing on and, and what does appropriate look like in this classroom? Right. Or in the school building. You know, great. Thanks, Beth. Jeff needs to work on communication when frustrated, but mm -hmm. also compassion when cursing at peers and, and adults, you know, thinking about how do, do you think they feel when you say those things? Yeah, so that's a twofer right there. That's, that's yeah. two skills, yes. And I'm hearing, he can be taught coping skills and how to de-escalate, you know, de-escalation yeah. skills, you know, calming himself back down mm -hmm. or recognizing, wasn't there a comment in there somewhere about, you know, when he when he felt that way he couldn't hear as well so he has some understanding of you know that um, something's feeling you know when i feel this way yeah um, so that could even tee up that you know learning of the coping skills and de-escalation yeah thanks i'm oh go ahead no because um, oh well i'm thinking of the data that was collected to support teaching those skills so um, when we go back to the stuff that we've learned from teachers, but also, um, you know, what, like you're, when you're gathering that information about, you know, how often these verbal threats happen and when, so what, if we're doing ABC data, are, when are we noticing what happens before we see him start to get, um, engage in those behaviors? What was the thing, what was the antecedent? Um, the data shows that it's unfamiliar reading. So that is data that we would use to guide um, teaching those skills for those behaviors we're seeing. And, you know, what kind of environmental supports can we put in for Jeff um, in there? So think about that. If you see that he's getting upset when unfamiliar reading tasks are being presented, what kind of environmental support um, can you provide for Jeff for accommodation? One thing might be, you know, the, the teachers kind of calling things out, you know, mentioning, you know, when he starts to respond, maybe if there was something that was nonverbal, because that invites the whole classroom to notice, you know, and then he, you know, if that's a piece of the, that escalating behavior. Yeah. I'm thinking maybe if it's an unfamiliar text that he's not ready, that he's not seen before, like, could we 
you know, send it home the night before if that's something, or maybe he's able to go over it um, before they get to reading class. I, maybe even letting Jeff know that it's going to be an unfamiliar text and, you know, providing that pre-correction of like, hey, you've got this skill, I know, and then I'm here to support you through this piece. So that relationship and understanding of, you know, Jeff's needs. Yeah, Christina said, give the student a heads up of this. This is what we'll be doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if if Jeff probably isn't the only student in that classroom that that gets a little angst going when there's something unfamiliar, you know, in, in mm -hmm. reading. So, you know, how can how can we instructionally telegraph our play a little bit better, you know, given yeah. that that heads up? Yeah, we often know that a lot of the environmental supports, while we specifically design them for um, Jeff or a student, some of the things that we put in place just to kind of create a more supportive environment for our kids or specific kids, other kids respond well to as well, like to them too. So um, it, yes. it could be a game changer for so many. Yes, Christina added, I like to be aware of what's coming when it's something new. <laughs> and I'm with you, Christina. <laughs> totally, totally. Anything else? All right. So, oh, there we go. We've got some comments. So uh, go ahead in the chat if you've got some comments or questions or um, anything you'd like to share. Uh, there's another comment from from Beth, maybe talk about a book or reading ahead of time to give Jeff a summary before the reading or the work that comes with with that. Yeah. And again, other students might might benefit from that, too. But there, there are probably totally. a few others. <laughs> yeah, I agree. All right. So uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is create the plan, right? Instruction and supports. So implement the interventions, monitor with fidelity of instruction and document and report progress. So how we've got to talk about, we can put an excellent plan in place for him, all these different supports um, of how we're going to um, support Jeff and, you know, building those replacement behaviors and those skills, but if we're not implementing the plan and monitoring it and documenting it, then it's not going to work for Jeff, right? And it's not going to work for you or the people across settings that are seeing or experiencing these behaviors. So it's important that we put those three pieces together. So now we are on creating the intervention plan. Uh, this is where your team comes in place. So instructional roles and responsibilities. Who's gonna be responsible for teaching the identified replacement skill? Who will be responsible for making sure the environmental changes are embedded in the setting? Who's gonna collect and document his progress? So I know that sometimes I've had case conferences where some teachers have had to leave when we're putting this plan together. So who, if they have to leave, who's going to make sure that we're, they know their role or they know what changes are happening and that they're actually going to get done, right? We can put, like I said, put this great plan together, but how are we gonna make sure that, you know, who's gonna collect and document his progress? All of those roles and responsibilities are essential to um, implementing a behavior intervention plan. Um, so, so still talking about the implementation roles and responsibility. So we're thinking about, what do we know about this student to support them as a learner? So what skills do other staff need to support his intervention plan? Like I said, if you are having someone else help you collect data, um, you need to model and show them how to collect those data, that data piece on them. If it, you know, information skills, if you're all using a common language or a nonverbal prompt, making sure that everybody understands what that is and when it is used. Uh, so it's very important that everybody that is on Jeff's team or Jeff has um, interaction with, that they have the information and skills to support him. And then 
how will we know that Jeff's making uh, learning replacement skills um, progress on those things? And then, or that it needs to be revised. So we need to make sure that we're looking at the progress Jeff is making or not making and then revise or change things to, um, to reflect what kind of progress he's making. So we're gonna go back into that IIEP system and we're going to document the uh, behavior intervention plans. You're gonna talk about those evidence-based instructional strategies you're using, what you're gonna use to maxify, maximize those reinforcement of replacement behaviors, minimizing those pieces, and those behavioral goals or skills to be taught and learned. I know that when this system changed a few years ago and it came to these questions, I really relied on these guiding questions to help me fill out um, the behavior intervention plan, pulling from that functional behavior assessment and using those guiding questions to help me build that piece. So it's very important. Also, if we're going, when, as we all know, the IEP is a working document and it can be revised before the annual case conference. And if you're changing things in the IEP or even in the intervention plan, you need to go down to that red arrow and pick, is it going to be implemented as written or did things need to change? So there might be a change in his schedule or there might be a change in the classroom environment that those changes that could happen in the ex present levels or when you're just putting a different plan together could impact that behavior intervention plan. So then you would need to say that it's been determined to implement with revision. So always making sure that when you put this plan in place, but you may make changes elsewhere or there's a conversation that you're documenting those things and you're saying it was done with revisions, but if nothing changes, it's just implemented as written. Sorry about that. My mouse is very tricky. <laughs> All right. So now we're moving on to the implement the plan, implement the plan with fidelity. So if he's not making progress in the skills, is that plan working? Um, I don't, it doesn't sound like it is. So we need to go back and review the plan and check with fidelity of instruction or rate a positive feedback and um, an instructional match or instructions to match the student, right? So if we're not implementing the plan with fidelity, it may not be that this is this plan doesn't work for Jeff. It may be that we're not implementing it so that it can work for Jeff. Um, so making sure that we're doing that plan or let's say that it is being done with fidelity and we're not seeing the progress that we want to see or that we would expect. So maybe there are adjustments that we need to make, or maybe we have seen progress in one in an area and we need to make an adjustment to tweak another piece of it. So it's always important to be going back and looking at the progress of the student and seeing if things need to be changed or uh, in the plan to so that they continue to make progress or um, meet their needs. Like I said, continue working on those skills, the positive feedback, continue monitoring if they are making progress and getting towards that level of mastery, right? And then if they've reached that anticipated level of mastery and generalization, you're gonna document that skill growth. That is something that you really wanna put in the IEP, like we're seeing changes and positive changes to this kiddo. And then you discontinue the behavior intervention plan and you celebrate. This is something that's wonderful. So progress, monitoring and looking to make sure that the plan is implemented with fidelity um, allows you an opportunity to continue to meet the student's needs and hopefully get to that level of mastery and generalization so that they don't need a plan anymore. So it's, you know, very similar to our, you know, our academic pieces where we, we put a plan together for a student, we design instruction for them and we document their growth and make sure that we're implementing it with fidelity. And then hopefully they close that gap with um, in comparison to their peers and they've mastered it. So we have the same um, expectations for how we implement a behavior intervention plan. All right, do we have any questions? Are there 
barriers to completing this process? Like what other further skills or knowledge um, you might want or uh, like what else can you take away from today's discussions? I know it was a lot of information that was um, provided to you guys today. Again, this is an opportunity for you to toss your questions in the chat or yes. comments that you have about the, the material that was reviewed today and shared with you. I'm also gonna drop the, the evaluation link into the chat. I'll do that a couple of times before we, we end. Yeah. but no comments. Oh, wait, someone said this was very helpful. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome, Beth. <laughs> and thanks. So Danielle says she hasn't had a chance to open the Padlet yet. Um, are there additional resources available or other than the slides? Oh, yes, there's, there's a lot of information there's on that Padlet. <laughs> yeah, that Padlet has um, those that data those data collection resources, which are super, help, super helpful and just kind of guiding um, the different ways that you can collect data or what kind of data that you need. I know that that was something that I've really, I've reverted to and even using to support um, others in training. So that's great. There's other like stuff. I think Paula Kluth has some stuff on there, but yes, that Padlet is a wealth of knowledge. Okay, Meredith appreciated you, know, you breaking down the information. And Craig says this is going to be extremely helpful going forward in creating BIPs. So. Yeah. And like while you may not have a lot of questions now, or you might come up with questions later, our contact, and I'll get to, I'll go ahead and move forward um, with that piece, but our contact info um, is on here. And you are more than welcome to reach out to, you know, Elisa or myself, and we can help you know, if you've got any further questions or anything like that, but that Padlet's right there. Hopefully you guys have gotten that um, information written down, but padlet.com, IEPRC, developing BIPs. And then just kind of a checkout thing. We've talked about the behavior today. Um, which puppy represents your feelings and thoughts about addressing student behaviors? Um, if you guys wanna throw your choice in the chat, just so we can kind of understand if you're feeling still feeling tired or excited or something like that just kind of understand the oh we got a three <laughs> okay, a two there with a thank you <laughs> there we go. Yeah, yeah. at first like one but then i was a two all right <laughs> meredith was <laughs> meredith's like it's too much <laughs> a two Perfect. there's some twos with thank yous all right that's encouraging Someone said started it at a one and a four, but <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and now a two. <laughs> Perfect. I love to hear that. Um, going forward, just, I mean, I'm hearing you guys feel a lot better about this, which is great. Um, the recording will be up on our, Elisa, will it be up on our YouTube? Um, it will be on YouTube and typically they send, uh, I think we're still sending yes. them out, you know, yeah. as a follow up to those yeah. that, that Thank, register. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, the recording will come up um, to if, if you signed up to this, it'll be sent out and you're able to view it there. Uh, also, here is Elisa's put the evaluation link in the chat, but here's another one where if you guys can do, we really do appreciate the evaluations. They help um, guide our, you know, training or feedback to help us figure out like what do you guys need, what went well, what didn't go well, and what, you know, do you need more or um, something else. So we really do appreciate the uh, feedback. And as always, we have more trainings on our website uh, to help you. There's tons of, you know, outside of behavior as well that uh, to help improve imp your professional practice or just give you a little more information about stuff. Um, Yes, you will get a certificate coming with the um, into your email when you 
like at, I think it's when the recording is sent out, but the certificate yes. will be sent to you for sure. Yes. And then, oh, sorry, Lisa. No, I was just saying that's correct. Okay. Yeah. And then contact info, you can get a hold of me, uh, email, or, and that's my phone number. If you have any questions or you, you know, you want to provide feedback or anything like that, I am happy to answer or uh, support you. And then, Alisa, my uh, counterpart, hers is right here too. So just first name that last name at indstate.edu. And then if you've got any other questions, we've got um, just our contact info, email, uh, website, and then we've also got stuff on our social media. Our YouTube has a wealth of uh, videos that are all, all kinds of stuff, um, behavior, UDL, NTSS. Um, there's some stuff on goal writing in there. So there's tons of videos for you to watch if you want to check those out as well. But I think that is it for us today. Um, we are part of the resource network. Uh, there's Hands in Autism, I mentioned them earlier. They have tons of resources for you as well. Project Success, um, we work with them. There's tons of different places that uh, are part of our resource network. So um, checking those out as well can be helpful, but that is it. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Have a good day. You. Good week. Yeah. Hopefully you're close to spring break. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to end this. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you. Have a great day.